The Suicide Squad is much, much better than Suicide Squad. Even the director, David Ayer, might agree, since he's said repeatedly that the final film that made it to theaters is not his film, and fans are prodding Warner Brothers to release the Ayer cut. And we've got a trivia question for you. How many actors have played Joker in live action? 69. <laughs> Put your answer down in the comments and we'll give you the real answer at the end of the video. And we could go on all day about what makes James Gunn's Suicide Squad a superior film, but I think each movie actually has one very similar scene that shows why one is this and the other is this. Shit, your trip sucks. But first, let's briefly go over the movie's many similarities. Some of these are obvious because they're both movies about the same team with the same actors, but James Gunn also made some choices that directly parallel the unair film. Both movies show Amanda Waller recruiting a team of supervillains from Bell Reef Prison to send them out on dangerous missions. The main character is a marksman who never misses. I always hit my target's dead center. Each of these leads has a daughter who Waller uses as leverage. There's also a big strong monster guy, Harley Quinn, a guy with a haunted past who hates his powers, a team member who can control others, and they're both led by Rick Flagg. There's also team members who betray the squad who then they have to turn around and fight, and Harley Quinn has a side story. Team members die early to show how disposable they are. Each movie has a theme of control. Waller controls the team, and there's a villain who breaks free from government control and then controls ordinary people. After going to a bar together, the teams bond and make a decision to fight the monster even though they don't really have to. Each movie is also tasked with introducing several new characters to the screen and is filled with needle drops. And that's what I want to talk to you about today, Screen Crush, how these characters are introduced and how each movie uses needle drops to tell their stories. First, let's talk about Suicide Squad. This movie has an infamous production that I'm not going to spend too much time recapping, but basically, Warner Brothers committed to a darker tone for the DCEU, and in March 2016, Batman vs. Superman underperformed because it only made $800 million. So they quickly course corrected, pushing for the film and production, Justice League, to be more lighthearted. And at that point, Suicide Squad was already in post-production. And then the first trailer came out, and it was a smash. It's gonna save the world. The studio said, oh, we want the movie to be more like the trailer, so they hired the actual company who made the trailer to re-edit the movie. And this is why the entire movie uses needle drops like a two hour long movie trailer. And by the way, needle drops aren't bad. So the definition is any time a movie's taken over by the immediate entrance of a pop song. And some of the greatest movie moments ever are needle drops. I'll see you later. Thanks. What are you doing? You leaving your car? And thousands of others. What makes these examples great is that they were chosen to express how the characters were feeling in that scene. And then the audience is drawn into their emotional state. Karen is swept up in Henry's power and influence. Mia Wallace wants to party and she's attracted to Vincent Vega. You get it. The first four minutes of Suicide Squad features three different needle drops. The first is the opening track, House of the Rising Sun, which is about a whorehouse, not a prison. But the movie doesn't actually care what the song is actually about. They just want you to focus on the first line or the hook. House of the Rising Sun is in New Orleans. Belle Reve is the big house in New Orleans, so they put the song in there. Harley Quinn gets an intro set to You Don't Own Me because she doesn't want the guards to tell her what to do. And then Amanda Waller is introduced to Sympathy for the Devil because she's the devil. And this just keeps happening over, over, over. She's a super freak, get it? Again and again, the movie uses pop music as a shorthand to tell us who these people are and to make the audience feel a certain way, which is okay as a concept, but the problem is that the movie relies on this technique to tell the audience how we're supposed to feel every single moment. And when that moment is over, usually about 40 seconds, the song fades out and the movie resumes. This movie is so afraid of people getting bored that every big moment in the film is given a new pop song, like, like a wrestler's entrance music. Suicide Squad is a great example of why this is a bad technique for introducing characters. In fact, the unair cut is a masterclass in how not to introduce a large cast. 
The movie starts with Deadshot and Harley in jail. We learn that he's a badass and she's insane. Then Waller describes them to Chief Hopper. There's a Deadshot flashback and then a Harley flashback. At this point, one third of the movie is flashbacks. Waller describes the lesser characters using shorter flashbacks. We are now 20 minutes into the movie and nothing's happened. Then she describes the villains some more to a generic conference room with a couple of LED TVs with White House logos on them. This should have just been where her first pitch happened. Finally, she recruits the team one at a time, but not before giving Will Smith a chance to show off his skills, which entails shooting a bunch of targets, and this is completely unnecessary since we've already seen a much cooler scene where he ricochets a bullet to kill a snitch. So then, finally, at around minute 38, the heroes finally get out of jail, and oh wait, the Joker, we gotta do Joker stuff. Okay, finally, at 43 minutes in, the team is out of jail, the pieces are in place, out, wait, here's Katana. This is Katana, she's got my back. I would advise not getting killed by her. Her sword traps the souls of its victims. And now we're off on the mission. And all through this crap, there are so many needle drops. So the one scene that I think sets these movies apart is Harley's fight scene. In Suicide Squad, the team has just encountered the asphalt zombies for the first time. Harley's texting Joker and she's trying to leave the team. Then, tarmac monsters burst into the elevator and we get a poorly edited elevator fight. Like this shot, where Harley walks up the wall and does a flip. They cut to this shot to showcase this move. It's why they put the camera on the ceiling. And yet, rather than cut on action, which is action fight editing 101, they hold for an entire second before she executes the move. And it's not even cut well to the song. There's a line in the song where they say, and Harley doesn't even swing her bat on that line. I think this song is here because it's cool that she finishes the fight when the chorus hits. Hey guys. But like, why this song? What is it saying about Harley? Is she a big fan of K7 or early 90s hip hop? How does this express the emotion that she's feeling to help the audience connect with her? I mean, I guess she's trying to come to the Joker, but come on, that's a weak reason. No, look, they picked this song because it's cool when the hook hits and that's about it. If I might offer a small change, working my way back to you, babe, syncs up perfectly. See, in the scene, Harley is trying to escape the group to be with Joker. It's a character moment. She's leaving the team for her one true love. A sweeping love theme like this would have been great. In fact, if you don't believe me, find these two clips on YouTube and start the song right when the elevator fight begins. You'll thank me later. So now let's pivot and talk about The Suicide Squad, a movie with the same basic premise, but where the director was actually allowed to direct the movie. James Gunn is a master at introducing large casts. In Guardians, he focuses on the characters one at a time, and then gave them a single object of desire, the orb. But the Suicide Squad is a miracle. Gunn introduces us to two teams, and half the time the unair cut to introduce us to one. And there's also no distracting text on screen. The first team is introduced very quickly, more like the air version. We get the premise of the squad, as seen through the point of view of Savant. There's a charge in your neck, time off your sentence, you work for me now. Savant is our POV character as we meet the new team. The Bell Reeve workers take bets on the convicts, showing us they are expendable and also giving us a rundown of their powers. Brian Durlin, he's an expert in weapons and hand-to-hand -hand combat. Yeah. Well, I'm putting 20 on him, but he's gonna bite it. We even get some fun banter, so we'll like these guys and want to spend the movie with them. Your name is Letters? All names are Letters, dickhead. And then they all die, like 11 minutes in. Before we even meet Team 2, we understand that no one is safe in this movie. The second round of introductions is much slower, as we get to see how much care Bloodsport puts into cleaning gum off the floor. We meet his daughter, and then through him, we meet his other teammates. Then Waller gives the team, and us, a briefing. As the movie progresses, every action scene is used to reveal character. Like the stealth entry into the camp shows us how Bloodsport and Peacemaker don't like each other. which pays off later in the movie. Smaller bullets. What? They go inside your bullet holes without even touching the side. Ow. Smaller bullets. All of this is done by showing the audience who these people are, not telling us with abrasive needle drops and text on screen. You're late. You all got them. This is Katana. She's got my back. The Suicide Squad does something revolutionary. It uses character to introduce characters. We see Bloodsport's tenacity in the gum he can't scrape off the floor, the same character trait that won't allow him to leave a giant alien starfish to terrorize innocent people. Needle drops are never used to tell us who people are. They tell us how people feel. Every single needle drop in the movie is diegetic, meaning that it's music that the characters can actually hear in the scene. 
When we listen to music, it affects our mood, and the same is true for these people in the movie. False in Prison Blues is playing at the start. It's a Johnny Cash song sung from the point of view of an inmate, which Cash sang at his prison concert as a way for him to give a voice to the disenfranchised, exactly what this movie is doing. So the opening song even sets a tone for how every character in the movie feels, unlike House of the Rising Sun, which was just there because it's set in New Orleans. But let's get to that one scene. It's another Harley fight scene when she breaks out of her cell. When the scene begins, she's singing, I'm just a gigolo slash I got no body. So in a way, because she's singing, this music is diegetic, except the song is playing in her mind. The song is a perfect choice for many reasons, so pardon me while I nerd out about this. First of all, the lyrics literally match her mood. Now, this is actually a mashup of two songs, I'm Just a Gigolo and I Got No Body. I'm Just a Gigolo was written in German in the 1920s, and the singer is lamenting how he used to look so smart in his military uniform, and now he has to dance for money. Und alle Herzen, so, in a meta way, this was an Austrian mourning the collapse of his institutions following World War I. And the person singing the song isn't allowed to feel real emotions. Their love is for sale, just as Harley's own attachment to society collapsed when she fell for the Joker. Now, she's a shill for Waller. She's not allowed to be herself or make connections to others. She feels entirely alone in the world. It's also appropriate that this version is a mashup of two songs, reflecting Harley's mental state, where the real world gets twisted and mixed up in her head. What well, she's a javelin. I'm waiting for God to tell me. Jesus Christ. Yeah, or him, or any of them, really. But also, the original Just a Gigolo was made popular in English by Betty Boop. Then we come Most people today know who she is on site, maybe from Roger Rabbit, but Betty Boop was, in the 20s and 30s, an incredibly popular character, and even a sex symbol. She wore actual women's underwear, not children's clothing like Minnie Mouse. She presented a ditzy image to the world, but actually understood the characters around her better than they understood themselves, just like Harley Quinn. Psychologically speaking, vengeance rarely brings the catharsis we hope for. So, back to that scene. Mm. 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 Harley is singing the song, which immediately places us inside of her mind. Then the actual song takes over and we're slowly slipping into Harley's point of view. The circular room presents this fight as a kind of ballet, with Harley spinning and perfectly hitting her marks. This is expressed by the view shot from above, showing her red dress, the color of blood, spinning like poetry in motion. Later, the dress is even used as a weapon when she chokes a man with it. The hand-to-hand -hand part of the fight is played for laughs. Because, like Betty Boop, Harley is a cartoonish character who lives in a surreal slapstick world. And then, just after the bridge of the song, this moment. Now we are in Harley's mind. This is how she sees violence. Not as the gory, bloody affair that we just watched, but as something beautiful, feminine. It gives her purpose, like when she sees the javelin. Even the blood becomes a spray of flowers as the frame is filled with cartoonish Disney birds and we are fully in Harley's world. She is alone. She's got nobody because no one else could see the world like this, except for us. When she leaves the building, the music even fades out and is still playing in the building behind her, as if it was diegetic. Because for Harley, the music is playing along with the violence, and the violence is behind her in the building. But most importantly, this is establishing where Harley is emotionally in the movie right now. She has no team. She has no Joker. She is alone. So when she sees Rick Flagg rescuing her, actually giving a crap, it touches her emotionally. You were gonna save me? It was a really good plan, too. So this scene not only shows Harley's skills, it shows how she feels, and sets up her desire to join the team for the movie going forward. It is amazing. And now the answer to our Screen Crush trivia question. Six. But that's just my thoughts. Let me know yours down in the comments or at me on Twitter. And if it's your first time here, please subscribe. For Screen Crush, I'm Ryan Airy.